Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the third last class of uh, CS206. Um, before we uh, finish up our discussion on collective robotics today, we're going to spend uh, a fair bit of time talking about the pro uh, final project so you understand all the remaining expectations uh, we will have for you about the final project and what you can expect from Amanda and I uh, up to uh, the end of the course with respect to the final project. Okay, um, hopefully most of you uh, submitted Deliverable 3 uh, last night, which were sort of the stepping stones leading up to the, the final project. What are you going to be doing between uh, now and Monday, uh, May 17? Um, if you click on that link, it'll take you back to the uh, final project uh, description. And if you scroll down now, you will see that I filled out uh, what's expected for the final written report and the oral presentation. I'll come back to this document in a moment. Uh, timing wise, you are not submitting anything uh, next week. Um, the next thing you're going to be submitting for your final project are two uh, items, a written report and the oral presentation. And that is due uh, the Sunday night before our exam period, which is bright and early on Monday morning. So nothing is due uh, this coming Monday night. You're working on your final project up until uh, two weeks from now, a little less than two weeks from now. Sunday, when you'll be submitting your written report, your oral presentation. The following morning, I will post the oral presentation schedule here, um, and you will have uh, a grand total of two minutes and 30 seconds to uh, describe your final project orally. We'll talk about that in a moment. You'll see the schedule here. We'll all meet back here uh, on Monday the 17th at 7.30 a.m. here in this team's uh, meeting. And uh, you will unmute yourself and uh, describe your oral presentation uh, orally for two minutes and 30 seconds and then mute yourself and then enjoy hearing all the other wild and wonderful uh, robotics projects that your fellow students came up with. Okay, so what is the written report and what is the oral presentation? Uh, what are you going to be doing? Uh, what are you going to be doing up to the, the point of the delivery? What you're going to be doing is performing what's known as an A-B uh, test. And this is all described in a new uh, Reddit page, which I just added yesterday, which is module Q, the last module in this section. Um, and this will describe exactly what uh, an, al uh, an alpha beta test is, or a, uh, sorry, an uh, AB test is. What you're going to do is to take your uh, project as it currently stands and split it into two variants, A and B. So you're gonna have two different versions of your code base. You're gonna be analyzing the results generated by these two versions of your algorithm and analyzing whether one of these two variants is better able to evolve whatever behavior you're interested in better than variant B. That's, that's the idea. Alpha beta testing is, uh, is ubiquitous throughout, uh, uh, throughout, um, uh, throughout user interface design, robotics, engineering in general. You got two versions of something, which version is better? That's, that's what an A-B test is. Uh, is for. Okay. Um, for those of you, uh, for those of you that have been working on a single quote unquote hard project or a project of your own design, you're going to split it in some way over the next week and a half into variation uh, A and B. Sorry, I see there's a, there's a, someone has a hand up. Missy has her hand up. Missy, did you have a question? Um, I think you just answered it in that last sentence. Yep. Um, I'm going to ask if it matters how we split it, like if we could use um, just a variation of the class for the A part and then a different variation of that class for the B part. Yes, that's fine. It's up to you how you want to how you want to divide divide it into A and B. There's much more detail in the Reddit page itself. I'll just give you sort of the overview uh, today. The, the basic idea, like much of what we've been looking at in this course, is we're trying to get at a basic question, which is what is the best way to autonomously generate 
autonomous behavior for a machine, right? Your machine is autonomous. It's being controlled by a neural network, not someone using, not a human operator using a remote control. So we have autonomy in the neural network controller of the robot, and then we have the autonomous design or optimization or the autonomous training uh, section of your code, which is the evolutionary algorithm, or in your case, probably the parallel hill climber. So ultimately, um, from an engineering point of view, we don't really care about all of that. We just want a robot that reliably and autonomously does behavior X, whatever behavior X is. And as you probably learned in this course, there's a gazillion different uh, ways we could modify the robot, its controller, the fitness function, the parallel hill climber. I want you to create some two variants of this and compare them, which, which is better. Um, simplest way you could split this is to uh, take what you currently have and make a modification to the parallel hill climber. There's lots of ways you could tinker with the parallel hill climber to make it a little bit better or possibly unintentionally make it worse. How do you know? That's what the A-B test uh, is for. Okay. As you'll see in uh, the Reddit page, the first, the first section of this talks about the question. So it's very important as you start to work on this part of the final project is to think about what is the actual question you're trying to uh, answer. There are good questions and bad questions. Here's an example of a good question. Does the quadruped that, we, that you developed uh, before you started your final project, does the quadruped evolve to move further than the hexapod? So assuming that you worked on the bodybuilding project where you made a modification to the robot's body, which of these two robots evolves to move further for a fixed computational budget? What do we mean by computational budget? Basically just how much compute does your computer throw at the quadruped and how much compute does it throw at the hexapod? We wanna compare apples to apples, right? So if someone comes to you and says, listen, I'd like you to, uh, I'd like you to train an autonomous robot for me and I'll pay for you to have a month on Google Cloud and I'll give you this many nodes. You're always gonna have a fixed computational budget. What is the best use of that budget to produce something? So um, that would be one example. Um, obviously not everybody worked on the bodybuilding uh, project. As I mentioned, you could, uh, instead of modifying the robot body, you could instead stick with the robot body you have and the fitness function and make a variant A and a variant B of your parallel hill climber and ask the same question. Which of these two parallel hill climber variants produces faster locomotion for the quadruped given the same computational budget for parallel hill climber A and parallel hill climber B. Okay, um, feel free to just uh, unmute yourself and ask a question or type something into chat as we go. I wanna make sure we use, we, uh, use our time this morning to, to make sure everyone's on the same page about what's expected for the final project. Okay, um, some of you have tried uh, two or more, uh, some of you have tried two or more projects over the last uh, three weeks. If two of those projects are comparable, and there's an explanation in Reddit, um, you can treat those two projects as A and B and make sure, and then compare those two variants. So what does it mean for them to be comparable? For example, um, some of you have been working on the jumping project. So um, what is not comparable is asking, um, does the original quadruped evolve to locomote? Does it locomote better than the jumping robot evolved to jump? So comparing those two things, better locomotion versus better jumping, it's not really clear how to compare them. So they're not comparable. It's apples to oranges. So there's lots of different versions of your code that you can imagine, but not all of them can be compared directly to one another. We need to have basically a common currency, apples to apples. The rule of thumb for knowing whether they're comparable is you have the same fitness function. If you have the jumping robot, you might have two different uh, ways of evolving jumping for the robot. As long as they have the same fitness function, you can compare them. You could ask for these two versions of the parallel hill climber, which of them evolves better jumping 
according to this fitness function for the robot. Okay. So I want you to spend some time this week uh, coming up with what your A and B variants are. You could modify the robot's body. You could modify the parallel hill climber, as I just mentioned. You could also compare variants of the robot's neural network controller. You could ask for this fitness function using this parallel hill climber and using this robot. Here are two different types of neural network architectures. For example, neural networks with hidden neurons a neural network with hidden neurons and a neural network without hidden neurons. If you evolve those two different types of brains for the robot, which of those brains makes it easier for evolution to evolve locomotion or jumping or whatever behavior it is that you're interested in? Any questions about that? So far, so good? Okay. So you're going to come up with your question. Um, once you've come up with your question, you're going to start to generate some data. If we're going to compare variant A and B, you need to record fitness values generated by both of those algorithm variants as they run. So uh, you're going to spend some time uh, doing that. Once you have data generated by variant A and B, you're gonna go back to using um, the matplotlib library to visualize and compare these two data sets. Um, there's a link in here that'll take you back to the sensors module. Uh, if you remember when you were working on sensors, you were using the matplotlib package to plot how a sensor value changes over time. Now you're going to be plotting how fitness values change in your parallel hill climber over evolutionary time from generation to generation to generation to generation. We've seen a lot of fitness uh, curve. Uh, we've seen a lot of fitness curves plotted uh, in this course so far. OK, once you've plotted the data, then you need to ask the question. Uh, you need to ask the question, did A do better than B? Or did B do better than A? Or are A and B not really any different? Neither uh, parallel hill climber variant produced better locomotion than the other variant. So we're going to test, you're going to do some tests to actually compare uh, whether, uh, whether one variant did better than the other uh, or not. Okay, there's some uh, optional things for you to try down here. So you're going to work your way through this over the next uh, 12, 13 days or so, and then write it up in a four-page uh, report. We'll talk about the report in a moment. So far, so good. Any questions? Okay. Okay, so um, once you've done all that, um, you're going to write it up as a report as follows. The report should have four sections in it, about one page per, sec per section, so about a four-page report, not, not very long. Points will be taken off for poor writing quality. Uh, make sure to describe in your report what additional functionality you have added to your system since the last weekly deliverable. So. Uh, neither N N Amanda nor I can remember the details of all the 55 different projects going on uh, in the class. So please make sure to remind us in the first section what you've done and what you've done since Deliverable 3. So the first section to describe your goals. What project, did you, project or projects did you tackle during the deliverables? And then which among those projects or how did you go about splitting them into an A and B variant? So what exactly is your A and B uh, variant? Given those two variants, what is the question that you tried to answer? None of the rest of your report is going to make any sense unless we know what question you were trying to answer. Okay. Second section, uh, again, about a page long, is sort of implementation details. Where did you have to make changes in the two halves of your code base, search.py and simulate.py? Where did you meet, need to make changes to create the A and B variants? Um, please don't include any code snippets here. It doesn't really help us much to uh, read code. Just a high-level strategy, high-level description of where changes were made. So uh, in the parallel hill climber, I had to go in and make these changes to how the solutions are evaluated, sort of things at that, at that level. 
Okay, so the third section is all about uh, results. The nice thing about doing the results is you're going to generate a bunch of plots. Uh, so on this third page, you should include uh, several uh, uh, visual depictions of the data that was uh, that was uh, generated. Most importantly, what we're going to be looking for is that evolution actually did occur. If you imagine these fitness curves that we've seen many times throughout the course, um, if the end of the curve is is no higher than the beginning of the curve. So if we imagine evolutionary time on the horizontal axis here, if the, uh, the end of the curve is no higher than the beginning of the curve, that means that if the fitness of the final evolved solutions is no higher than the fitness of the initial random solutions and evolution didn't occur. So you're going to prove to us that whatever it is you were evolving your robot to do, you were able to evolve it to do some version of it. You're going to, again, then in, in addition, try and convince us through these plots that variant A did better than B or B did better than, than A. Okay. Um, if there is a difference between the variants, you might have an idea why one variant did better than the other. And you might include, if you want, some additional graphs to try and prove this. We looked at uh, fo footprint graphs when we were talking about uh, when we were talking about legged locomotion, they're a way of showing how, quote unquote, clean the gait is. Is there a regular oscillation to the way the robot is moving? So any additional analysis you want to do here, um, by all means. Okay. Or screenshots of the robot and its environment. Anything here to communicate sort of what's going on visually in your, in your system. Okay, if you include, uh, wherever you include a figure, make sure to include a caption or at least some text that describes what we are supposed to be seeing in that, uh, in that figure. Okay, in the final section, the last page of the written report, we'd like you to demonstrate to us that you thought carefully about your final project. I know everyone is busy. I know this is a, a stressful and uh, difficult semester for everyone. Realize uh, there is an uh, infinite effort available to put into your final project, but I, I want you to demonstrate to us that you've learned something from this. And um, if you were, so for example, what, what did you find surprisingly difficult? What was surprisingly easy? So you're sort of introspecting or looking back on the final project and letting us know sort of how it went, what you learned, and so on. A good way to structure this discussion is to imagine if you had another year to work on this project. Some of you might be excited about that prospect, some not so excited about that process. A prospect. Hypothetically speaking, if you had another year to work on this project, how would you expand your pro your your project? What new features would you want to build into PyroSim or into the underlying physics engine PyBullet to achieve this? Um, if you had access to a 3D printer and you could hook that up to the simulator, what sorts of things would you try? Uh, what sort of things would you try out? For those of you that have taken machine learning courses, if you were to try and integrate the evolutionary algorithm with some of the machine learning things you've learned or deep networks, deep, deep neural networks, reinforcement learning, some of the other aspects of AI that are adjacent to evolutionary robotics, how might you go about putting those pieces uh, together? Yeah, okay. Okay, any questions about the written report? No. Nope. Okay. Just a reminder: it's due Sunday, May sixteenth. Um, there is no uh, grace period for this. Uh, Amanda and I are also extremely busy. We have fifty-five written reports and fifty-five oral presentations to grade immediately after uh, after the exam period. So everything needs to be in uh, Sunday night. No exceptions. Here's where to submit. Um, you're going to be submitting it as a PDF document, four pages, double spaced is fine, single spaced is fine, 12 point, 11 point, 10 point is fine. We're not too strict about length as long as you, you cover these four points in sufficient uh, detail. And it's worth 6% of your final grade. Okay, that's the written report. Let's talk about the oral presentation now. Um, it's got this more or less the same flow as the written report. It's going to contain four sections again. Uh, and like the written report, we're looking for clarity of communication. As you orally present, uh, if we can't understand uh, what you're saying, 
then then we can assess the quality of, of what you're trying to communicate. Okay, in the results section of your, of, uh, uh, sorry, in the oral presentation, you're, you're recording a two and a half minute long YouTube video. Sorry, I should maybe describe this first. You're gonna be recording a two minute and 30, a, a two minute and 30 second uh, video to YouTube. The video has no audio, it should be silent. When you're presenting orally, I will play your video for you. You will unmute yourself and you will narrate your video. Okay. So what you're, uh, what you're submitting, uh, which I shouldn't say oral presentations here, sorry, uh, and video. So you're submitting your video on Sunday night and then you're presenting orally over your video Monday morning. Okay. Okay, so in the results section of your video, you will likely want to show an evolved behavior and a random behavior to communicate to us that evolution actually improved behavior and what that behavior is. Um, obviously, the written report, all you can do is use words uh, and images. The, the videos, however, are really going to communicate what you've been able to evolve. It should be pretty clear to us by watching these two videos to see there's a clear difference between the random and the evolved behavior to be, to be convincing that evolution actually uh, occurred here. Okay. Uh, this says, please record yourself talking over the video. I'm sorry, that's incorrect. Please record a silent, a silent video. During the presentations, we will play the videos muted. Uh, we will play the videos. When it's your turn, you'll be asked to unmute your mic, talk over your video, and then mute your mic again. If for some reason we cannot hear you or you lose Wi-Fi, uh, the instructor will play your video with the audio turned on. Ah, now I see why. Okay, my apologies. Okay. I misspoke here. So you are going to record yourself actually talking over your video during the presentations. We'll play it muted. Uh, now I'm remembering this happening from last year. We had some issues with some people with their Wi-Fi. You will record yourself talking over your video. You, the video will run silent during the oral presentations. You'll unmute yourself and talk over your video. If you can't connect for some reason, we will just play your video uh, with the audio turned on. Sorry about the confusion there. All good? Okay. Um, like we've been doing all along, if you don't have any screen, screen capture software, just record your screen using your phone. Uh, no points will be deduct, deducted for poor video. However, if the video is so poor that we cannot see what we are supposed to see in the video, then points may be deducted. So just make sure we can see what we need to see uh, in the video. Upload your video to YouTube, make sure the link uh, is public, and then copy and paste the YouTube URL uh, to Blackboard. Um, between Sunday night and Monday morning, sorry Amanda, it's gonna be a, a, a very early morning or a very late, late night for you. Amanda will stitch the videos together into a single YouTube playlist that will contain 55, two and a half minute long uh, videos. Um, you have to submit by Sunday night. If it's not there, when Amanda goes to stitch it into the playlist, um, you will receive zero for your oral presentation and you will not be able to present on Monday morning. Okay. We'll all meet uh, back here on Teams, 7.30 a.m. Monday morning. Uh, I will share my screen. You'll see the oral presentation schedule here in Teams, and you will watch uh, me play and project to you the running YouTube playlist. Okay. Uh, when your video starts, please unmute your mic, talk over your video, and then mute yourself again. Uh, in order to keep us on time, we got 55 very short presentations uh, to get through. Um, we're going to play all the videos one after the other with no pause in between. So the minute you see in the schedule that you're next, prepare yourself. The moment you see your video come up, mute yourself and start talking. If the previous student is still talking, my apologies, I will mute the previous student. Okay. 
I will insert, insert two 10 minute breaks through these uh, presentations, a lot to sit through. So we'll, we'll take a couple breaks uh, throughout. Okay, so this means that when your video starts, you should start speaking immediately. If you run long, uh, I'm, I'm giving you a warning now, I'm gonna cut you off so that the next student has enough time. So be sure to practice. Two minutes and 30 seconds goes very, very fast. However, the advantage of giving a very short presentation is you can practice 10 times in half an hour and get this down perfectly. Um, you should basically memorize what you have to say. There won't be time to look down at your notes and back up again uh, and so on. So record early and practice, practice, practice. Let's do Sunday night. Here's where to submit. You're submitting a public YouTube video. Length must be two minutes and 30 seconds. If it's significantly longer or shorter, um, their points will be taken off. We got a lot of videos to get through in a short uh, period of time, and it's worth 6% uh, of your grade. Okay, um, it's going to be a lot of material uh, in these oral presentations, but it's also a lot of fun. You get a chance to see a lot of the really creative things that your fellow students have come up with. So, um, unfortunately, due to time constraints, we, there won't be time for each presenter to field uh, questions. However, it would be good to get a bit of a discussion going, and I think teams will actually work in our favor uh, in this case. So um, as you're watching your fellow students' presentations, you're encouraged to ask uh, your fellow students questions about how they did what they did or for clarification. Um, if you have a question, go ahead and type it into Teams, uh, into the Teams chat right here while uh, we're presenting. And then the current presenter, when you're done presenting, have a look at uh, have a look at the chat. And if there's any questions to you, please feel free to respond. And hopefully, we'll get a bit of a, a side conversation going while the presentations are proceeding. It would be wonderful if we were all together and we could treat this as a mini workshop where we present our work to each other and discuss. We'll do the best we can uh, remotely. Okay. So if you're finished presenting, check the chat window to see if there are any questions, and, and please. Uh, dive into the conversation. Okay, last point is about collegiality. I know we're all tired. I know you will have a lot of other demands on your time, but please do be here and be here for the uh, duration of uh, all of the presentations. There'll be a temptation to tune out uh, of the meeting, literally and or figuratively, as we all have a lot of demands of our attention on our time. However, uh, all of you have put a lot of effort into these projects. You've probably seen on Reddit um, the partial work from your colleagues. There's a lot of great and cool uh, projects. You've all put a lot of work in your final projects. There's a lot of creative work here to see and learn from. So please uh, use this opportunity to practice collegiality. Please extend your fellow students, especially those who are presenting towards, of the present, towards the end of the presentation period, the respect they deserve by staying and watching their presentations. Hannah has a question. Will we be able to see the order of presentations at the start so we aren't surprised when ours begins playing? Yes, absolutely. So uh, right at 7.30 a.m., I will screen share. Uh, I'll put up a link to the schedule with the, with the order of presentations. So everyone will have that at right at 7.30. You'll have access to that spreadsheet. So at 7.30 in the morning, you'll know exactly when you're going to uh, present. And as you watch the presentations, I will tick off on, this, on the presentation schedule where we are, so you'll know how many more presentations there are until you're on. The reason I don't post this presentation schedule before Monday is in the past, students have just checked when their presentation is, they've come and presented and then left again. I, I want everyone to be here for the full time and to enjoy and benefit from each other's uh, great work. Okay, that's why. Okay, um, any questions about that? Again, all the information is linked through here. Um, I suggest you go and read this uh, document. Go and read about the written report and the oral presentation. Have a read through uh, the linked Reddit page. And if you have more questions, uh, come and see me in office hours or uh, post a question during class on Thursday. I want to make sure, again, everyone is clear on what we're doing. Uh, obviously, some of the pieces are moving around here, so I want to just make sure everything's, everything's clear. 
Uh, Amanda has a question. Go ahead, Amanda. Just a couple of things about submitting the videos. Uh, I, I just really want to emphasize that uh, we've been pretty lenient with the grading um, over the semester. If you guys submitted like, you know, 1230 or one o'clock, we usually accept that and you don't get any points deducted. That, that will not be the case for these final videos. Um, you want me to get as much sleep as possible because Josh and I are going to be grading your videos at 730 in the morning. Um, and so, um, Really, I will compile these into a playlist, and then if if you haven't submitted them in time, it will not end up as the playlist. So please, please submit those on time or submit them early for your own sanity. It helps me start getting it stitched together. Um, the other thing is this is a, a new thing YouTube started doing. Please do not label your videos as for kids. If videos are labeled as for kids, I cannot put them into a playlist. So... Uh, just uh, just those two things. Um, I'll probably will remind you about that um, either. I don't remember the last classes this week or next week, but whatever. Uh, we'll remind you, but just a plea to please submit your videos on time. <laughs> uh, no for kids. It should be uh, make the link public and it should be not for kids. Thank you, Amanda. Yes, exactly. Please help us uh, preserve uh, Amanda's sanity. Absolutely, all videos need to be submitted by 11.59 p.m., no exceptions whatsoever. Should be clear at this point why. Okay, thank you everyone, appreciate it. I, again, I know the end of the semester is upon us. A lot of demands on your time and energy. As Amanda says, all the better. Feel free to get your oral presentation and written report submitted well before Monday, uh, before Sunday night. The earlier the better, then you can focus on other uh, other things. Okay. Any other questions, comments, clarifications I can provide? Okay. All right, so uh, back to uh, lecture. We are going to finish our discussion. I think we're gonna finish our discussion today on uh, collective robotics. Um, we looked last time at uh, coordination in the boids. Uh, we looked at we looked at uh, communication among the boids, and we uh, and we also looked at specialization um, among the lions. We looked uh, at the beginning of signaling. One lion could see what the other lion was doing just based on its relative position and heading from one lion to the other. So we looked at coordination, specialization. Today we're going to look at a specialization and signaling, so watching the movement of another organism or another machine in our case. But signaling through motion, it can only communicate so much information. So many species, ours included, has evolved beyond signaling to communication, verbally communicating information. Okay, we're gonna focus on communication uh, today. And then, um, unfortunately, we're gonna skip over the lecture on self-replicating swarms, always a good time. However, I've linked uh, the lecture slides and the reading, which is now optional if, if you're interested. And uh, on Thursday, we'll start in on the final theme of the course, which is broadening your evolutionary algorithm so that it can now tinker with the neural controller and the physical structure of the robot simultaneously, evolving brains and bodies. Uh, unfortunately, we'll only have time for two lectures uh, in this in this segment. The other two lectures I will uh, will be now be optional, and I'll provide links to them uh, on Thursday. Okay, so we're heading on to lecture twenty four, the evolution of communication. So as I mentioned, uh, verbal communication evolved several times uh, in, uh, in the animal uh, kingdom for various reasons. But the main reason is, of course, that you if you can view your if you can view your fellow uh, conspecific, your fellow organism, members of your species, and you can see what they're doing, that's providing you with information about what they're doing and may suggest what you should be doing, given what they're doing. What happens if you cannot see your conspecific? What happens if you're a primate in the foliage of a jungle and you cannot see what your fellow uh, primates are doing? You can call to one another 
uh, and signal communication that way. So in this uh, in this uh, lecture uh, in this lecture today, we're going to look at actually the oldest paper in the field. It's from 1991, again be long before uh, physics engines, and whether or not these agents that we're going to look at today are actually robots, we could argue. But I think this is arguably one of the more interesting projects still to this day in the field. It demonstrates the evolution of communication in uh, agents, I'll use the term agents today, in agents that do not start with the ability to communicate. So we're going to see first what are the conditions under which evolution, uh, under which communication evolves, and what is that, uh, what is that language. Language itself is a, a controversial word. Um, there's a lot of discussion in the literature about differences between signaling, communication, and language. So uh, pick your term, but these agents are going to evolve the ability to communicate to one another over distances. Okay. Um, these eight, let's start talking about the experiment itself. The experiment itself takes place in a grid world, meaning it's a, a series uh, of uh, grids or elements that you can see here. It's a 200 by 200 grid and it's toroidal, not unlike the virtual Serengeti plane that we saw a couple lectures back. Imagine we have this 200 by 200 grid. We curve it over like a piece of paper, so two of the edges touch, and then we take that tube and we curve it so that the two ends of the tube connect and we now have a donut and we now have a series of female and male agents that can move continuously along the surface of the donut and they never come to a wall right they can commu they can uh, they can continuously they can continuously move in the same direction forever this is the first experiment we've seen uh, where the agents actually have uh, have a, have sex. Uh, we're going to have males and females. Why ma females and males? In this particular experiment, this was an attempt to see uh, how communication between the sexes evolve, and we're going to actually see in this case an example of what's known as uh, sexual selection, unlike Darwinian selection, where males are going to be able to to produce male offspring more if they can convince uh, the female that they're worth mating with and vice versa. Okay. Among these set of 1600 uh, agents, uh, the females have certain sense, uh, have a subset of senses uh, and actions available to them, and the males have a non overlapping set of senses and actions available to them. The females are deaf. They cannot hear signals in the environment. As you're going to see in a moment, uh, the male, uh, the, the females are going to be capable of emitting signals, but they cannot hear signals. Females are deaf and immobile. They do not move, but they can emit signals. Males are blind, so they cannot see other males and they cannot see females, but they can hear, they cannot signal, and they are mobile. Okay, how does this work? How are we gonna implement this various set of uh, sensory motor capabilities for the female and the male agents? All 1600 agents, like your robots, are gonna be controlled by a neural network. Those neural networks have an input layer with uh, sensor neurons. There is a layer of hidden neurons and a final layer of motor neurons. You'll notice that both the female networks and the male networks have exactly the same cognitive architecture. Cognitive architecture, remember, is the arrangement of uh, sensor uh, is the arrangement of neurons and synapses. Both the females and males have uh, the same have the same neurons and synapses, but what the sensor neurons and what the motor neurons do is different in the female networks and the male networks. What do the females see? They are not blind, they can see. The input neurons record, uh, the, the, the sensor neurons record the position and orientation of the closest male in her visual range. So if we go back, 
we go back a moment and we take uh, this particular female here, she has a certain visual range represented by the thick line here. There are two males that she can currently see, but uh, her, input neuron on, uh, her input neurons only register the position and orientation of the closest male, which in this case is this one. In the example uh, female network here, the input neurons or the sensor neurons are registering that there is a male detected to the female's southeast, and that male is facing to the east. The, the female is sensing the male's position relative to her position. What kind of sensing is this? We talked about this when we talked about our virtual lions prowling the virtual Serengeti plain. If you're sensing things relative to yourself, what kind of sensing is that? As Missy said, this is diictic sensing. Exactly. Okay, you'll notice uh, in the cartoon picture here that the sensor neurons are binary values, and it says here male detected to the southeast. So uh, a male can either be north, northeast, east, southeast, south, southwest, west, or northwest of the female. So there are eight possible relative positions of males. So there are eight binary sensor neurons corresponding to those eight relative locations. If there's a male to the northeast, then the northeast sensor neuron changes from zero to one. If there is a male to the female's west, the west sensor neuron switches from zero to one. So among those eight sensor neurons, all of them are zero, and only there's only a one in one of those eight positions representing the closest male. If there is no male, if there is no male in the female's visual range, all of those eight sensor neurons are zero. There is an additional set of eight sensor neurons. So the female network actually has a total of 16 sensor neurons. The second set of eight sensor neurons registers the orientation of the male, assuming there's one in the female's visual range. So those, sen those 16 sensor neurons taken together tell the female where a male is relative to her and what direction that male is facing in. Okay. As always, those values flow from the sensor neurons down to the motor neurons. You'll notice there's some recurrent synapses in here, and there's also self synapses. This is a reminder to us that that means that the females are capable of remembering things. That's recurrent connections provide memory. And then finally, values arrive at the motor neurons. In I think pretty much everything we've seen so far, the motor neurons usually alter the movement or the actions of the robots. In this case, the values arriving at the output layer of the female networks are the female's song. This is again a binary, the motor neurons here are treated as binary values. The binary values are stitched together in a string and the resulting binary string is the song produced by that female, given whatever she just currently sensed and what she remembers. That song, is, uh, is the mating call, it's the binary vector that is output. And if there is a male in that female's visual range, uh, sorry, if there's a male, uh, if there's a male within that, the female's range, the male hears that song. How does the male hear that song? That binary vector is copied into the male network's input layer. So in this example here, this particular female senses this male, which causes, depending on what the synaptic weights are in this female's neural network, she produces a binary vector, which is her song, and that binary vector is supplied to the input layer for this male and the input layer for this male's uh, neural network. Like the female, the values at the input layer flow into the hidden layer. The male can also remember values flow to the uh, to the output layer uh, of the male neural network in this case the values are left as uh, are left as floating point values or i guess the picture here seems to suggest they're integers doesn't really matter for our purposes 
there are four, sorry, there are four uh, output neurons in the male neural networks. Whichever of these four motor neurons has the high, most positive value, the highest value, triggers one of four possible actions. Either the male stays still, the male moves forward, given its uh, current heading, or the male turns left or turns right. At every time step of the simulation, as you're gonna see here, the male has a particular position. It exists somewhere in the grid and it has an orientation. The male is facing north, east, south, or west. Okay. So, um, so at each time step, the male's neural network will dictate which of these four actions the male uh, generates or performs. We have 800 males, 800 females. So we have a total of 1,600 agents. Each has their own neural network, its own unique set of synaptic weights. Any questions about that before I move on? Okay. So um, what happens at every time step, at each time step of the simulation, we update all of the 800 females neural networks. Each of those 800 females emits her song. So we have 800 songs that are produced. We then uh, visit each male. If the male is within visual range of a female, it hears this, uh, the song of that female. If, the, if a male is outside the visual range of any given of uh, any female, then it receives zero. For each of those 800 males, they then uh, either stay still, move forward, turn left, or turn right. So we update the positions and orientation of the males. Remember that the females are uh, sessile or non-moving. We, uh, we then look to see, are there any points on the grid that are now co-occupied by a male and female? So has a male moved into the same cell as a female? If so, mating takes place. We take that uh, uh, parental pair, we make a modified copy of each, we take the male and we make a copy of its, the male parent, we make a copy of its neural network and we introduce uh, a random mutation to one or more of the synapses in the child, in the uh, male child. So male parents always produce male, uh, male offspring. We take the female network and we make a copy of the female network, which becomes the female offspring. We again copy that network and we introduce some random variation in the synaptic weights. So these two parents have now produced two children, a son and a daughter. Um, it's actually technically not mating because we do not combine genetic material from the males and females. Kind of an odd detail here, um, but they tried to keep things simple in this experiment. Since the male child, since the son inherits the network, more or less the same network from its father, and the daughter inherits more or less the same neural network from its mother, the female, uh, the, the daughter will behave kind of like the mother, and the son will behave kind of like the father. This is an important detail when we come back to talking about sexual selection in a moment. Okay, so we have these two new uh, agents. Um, for the son, we, we uh, look elsewhere. We find some other male at random in the population. Uh, we delete that male and we put the son in the position where we just deleted the male. So the son sort of outcompetes this other male. The daughter, we do the same thing. We find some female elsewhere in the grid, delete that female and replace her with the daughter. We then take the two parents, which are co-located in the same cell, and we move them. We put them, we put the male in some random unoccupied position. We take the uh, female and we put her in some unoccupied position. We continue looking for any other co-occupied uh, cells and repeat this process. This leads to evolution, but it is a very, very different evolutionary algorithm from any that we've seen so far. Yeah? Okay. 
Okay, so um, let's see what actually happens in this case. Um, at the beginning of this experiment, we start with a hundred. Uh, we start with eight hundred random male neural networks, eight hundred random female neural networks, and we can then ask at the beginning of this simulation, as it starts running, uh, what happens. We're going to look at uh, evolutionary changes in this population of six hundred uh, agents. In this particular experiment, we're going to look at, for the moment, um, the female output neuron. There are three uh, output neurons in the female network, and there are three input neurons in the male networks. So the length of the song is three. I'll just back up here for a moment. We can obviously make the song richer by adding motor neurons to the female networks and add sensor neurons to the male network. In this experiment, we're going to keep the songs pretty simple. We're going to restrict the length of the song to three, which means because it's a binary song, there are eight possible songs that can be sung in this simulation. Since we're creating random 800 random female neural networks, you can imagine that those 800 networks tend to produce on average uh, all of these, on average, produce uh, these eight songs some of the time. The males are moving around randomly and reacting randomly to the songs. No evolution has occurred yet. We have random neural networks. We can then ask among all of the males, what did they tend, what did these 800 males do on average whenever they came into uh, hearing, hearing distance of a female who emitted the song 000. 25% of the time the males turned for, uh, moved forward when they heard the song 000. 38% of the time they turned right. 9% of the time they turned left. 28% of the time they stood still. Same thing for the remainder of the other seven songs. So not surprisingly, this is kind of just a sanity check. The males uh, on average are doing one of the four actions 25% of the time, and it doesn't really have anything to do with any one of the eight songs. If you were a male agent in this universe, what is the first thing you might evolve to do? It takes a while to evolve the ability to uh, react to different songs and react to those songs appropriately. If you're a male and you're sort of thinking about what to do in this environment, you can't see females. The songs don't really have any meaning at the moment because the females are just emitting these songs at random. If you're a male, what's the best thing to do? You could face the sound. That's that's maybe a good thing to do. Yeah. Remember, though, that the males do not know where uh, where the song is coming from. They're blind. They cannot see the female. All they know that is that as they're moving, eventually, if they by chance happen to move into uh, the sensing ra or the song radius of a female. They will suddenly suddenly start hearing that song, but they don't know where the song is coming from, so they don't have the ability yet to face the sound. So what's the what's the first thing the males are likely to evolve to do? Perhaps an easier way to think about this is if you're a male, what's the worst possible thing you can do among the four actions here? Any ideas? Stand still is absolutely the worst thing you can do. After 5,000 updates of the simulation, you'll notice that all of the males have evolved the ability to just not stand still. Uh, this is after 5,000 updates. So this means we've updated all 1,600 agents once, twice, three times, 5,000 times. So there are no generations in this evolutionary algorithm. Well, I guess you could count an update as a, as a generation here. 
So they've all evolved the ability to not stand still. What do you? What ability of the males do you think is going to evolve next? What evolved behavior are we likely to see among the males uh, if we continue running past 500, 5,000 updates? You can already start to see the hints of what's coming next. If the females have not yet evolved the ability to uh, communicate anything, they are singing, but they're possibly, probably singing at random. There's not much information yet in the songs. If you're a male and your quote unquote goal is to uh, find a female, what's the best thing to do? As you're, as you're a male moving through this world, most of the time you hear zero, zero, zero because you're not, in, uh, you're not in hearing range of any of the females. From time to time, you hear something other than zero, zero, zero if you happen to pass inside uh, the song radius of a female. But you can't see her. You don't know where the song is coming from relative to yourself. What happens next? All of the males evolve to move forward and never turn right or turn left or stand still. If a male con agent continues moving in a straight line, there is a better chance that they are going to uh, find a female than if they are standing still or even turning left or turning right. If you're turning left or turning right, you are still occupying the same cell. You're staying where you are and you're losing one time step or one update of opportunity to find uh, a female. Remember that this is a, a toroid, so you can keep moving over the surface of uh, the donut. So the males evolve the ability to move forward. If the females never evolve the ability to signal or communicate information to the males, then this is the only thing that males can ever do. However, in this particular experiment, that is not what happened. They continued running the simulation, and after 15,000 time steps, they saw the following pattern, that most of the males had evolved to just always move straight. So if they heard, if they heard no song, they always moved straight. If they heard this song, this song, this song, this song, uh, or, uh, or, the, or this song, they would move straight. But most of the males, whenever they heard 101, they would start to turn right. And as long as they heard 101, they would just stay in place and continue to rotate to the right clockwise. The males, if they ever heard the song 110, they would continue spinning around and around to the left. That seems like kind of a bad thing to do because as I just mentioned, if a male is continuously turning in place, they are not likely to find a female. Presumably there are females that are emitting these songs. What's going on here? What, are the, what, it, what does the song 101 mean? What has the song 101 evolved to mean in this particular experiment? Whatever it means, what it means to the males, at least, how they interpret it is it's a signal or it's a communication that they should turn to the right. Why do the males turn right when they hear this song and turn to the left when they hear this song? Because the females have evolved to use this signal. Uh, they've used, they've evolved, uh, or, or, sorry, it says it up here. So the males have evolved to turn when they're on the same row or column as a female. The females have evolved to signal this information. So the female, uh, many of the females have evolved so that whenever there is a male that, uh, that enters into the same row or column that she occupies inside her song radius, when the male is at that position, so directly to the north of her, west of her, east of her, or south of here, her, she will start to, she will start to uh, emit one of these signals which causes the male to turn. 
when the male is now uh, on the same row or column as her and facing towards her, remember that the female can see the position of the male and the direction that the male is facing in. She stops, she stops emitting either this song or this song and emits any of the other six songs. When she does, if she starts to emit any of those other six songs and the male is facing towards her, that male will, will start doing what males typically do at this point in time, which is move forward, and they will find the female. Okay, so at this point in the simulation, uh, communication has evolved. Communication is difficult to evolve because you need two necessary conditions for communication to evolve. You need the signaler, which in this case is the female, to evolve uh, consistently the ability to emit specific signals, this song and this song, under, cert on, under certain uh, situations. You need the receivers to receive that information and reliably do the right thing under those conditions, which in this case is continue turning and turning and turning until you hear a different song. And in this case, that has occurred. Okay. As time continues in this, uh, evolu in this particular simulation, the females evolve the ability to emit these two special songs for more of these shaded cells. So the female is able to capture more males under a broader range of situations. Make sense? Okay. So that was uh, the test uh, experiment, which we just saw here. It's going to be this curve here. In this case, we are recording the uh, number of moves on average that the males need to take until they uh, until they find uh, or they come in contact with the female. At the beginning, when the males are moving and turning randomly, on average, it takes 200 uh, moves for any given male to find another female. But after communication has evolved, that time has reduced to on average 100 time steps or 100 updates for the average male to find an average female. The experimenters in this case did a control experiment. They re-ran this experiment starting from random controllers, but in this case they deafened, uh, they deafened the males. The males, uh, on average, could no longer hear the females, but interestingly, uh, sorry, in the con uh, let's see, did I describe this wrong? My apologies. This is the test case. This is the test case here. So in this case, uh, communication has evolved, as I just described, and it takes, on average, at the end, less than 50 time steps. It takes less than 50 time steps for males to find the females. In the control run, the males were deafened, which is this curve here. And not surprisingly, at the end of this run, the deafened males still took, a long, took much longer to find females than the males that could hear. So no communication or no language could evolve in the control case here. But we'll note, you'll notice that in the first 5,000 updates, the deafened males actually found females faster than the males that could hear. Why this initial faster rate of improvement in the control case for the deafened males? This seems kind of counterintuitive. Why? Why does this happen? This is a little tricky, and it highlights one of the difficulties uh, of evolving communication in the first place. Among these males that can hear, they alter their behavior based on signals they hear from females. Logan says, uh, because the signals are confusing for the males that can hear. So this is the sensitive period in here. In here, there, the evolutionary dynamics among the male and female networks are evolving. Um, it's hard to say that the me me females are trying to signal to the males. That implies goals, and that, that's a little difficult. But 
Uh, basically speaking, it, what Logan says is the case. The males are being confused. Sometimes they turn in the wrong direction and then start moving away from the females. Takes just the right set of conditions for emitters and receivers to evolve the ability to emit uh, and a, sig a signal under the appropriate conditions and for the receivers to receive it and do the right thing. If that occurs, if both situations occur, we get benefits for both groups. Okay. Okay, uh, we got 10 minutes left. Oh, uh, 10 minutes left. Let's have a look at an example of this actually at work. So here's a female who's emitting the song. This is during, this is after some uh, uh, evolution has occurred. The female is emitting the song 000. Here is a male um, and the male is outside her uh, signaling radius. So this male hears nothing or hears 000. The next time step, the male is facing north, so moves one cell to the north, and the female changes her signal. The input layer for this female has changed now that there's a male in her presence. She has altered her song. The song, however, does not alter the behavior of the male. The male continues moving north moves north again. When the male is now here, you'll notice that the female changes her song yet again, now to 011. The male stays where he is and he turns to the right when he hears this particular song. When he turns, the female detects that change in his orientation. The female changes her song and the male moves forward when the ma this male hears 101. Okay, I want to skip ahead now because uh, we have nine minutes left and I want to end with this particular experiment. They took everything that I just described, they went back to the beginning, um, they created another 800 random females, another 800 random males, but they further reduced the uh, diversity of songs that the female can emit. They created females with two output neurons and the males had two input neurons, which means that the female can only emit four different songs, 00, 01, 10, and 11. For each one of those four songs, a male can do one of four things. So under this case, when a male hears zero, zero, the male can stay still, go forward, turn left, turn right. For this song, the male has four options. For this song, the male has four options. And for this song, the male has four options. If only one song was possible, there's four different things the male could do. For two songs, there are four times four possible things the male can do. Uh, so four to the two. If there are three possible songs that the male, uh, the female can emit, there are four times four times four, or four to the three possible things that the male can do. In this experiment where there are four possible songs, there are four times four times four times four, or four to the four equals 256 different ways the males can respond. That allowed the experimenters by restricting the female song to, to create this table and this table has 256 entries in it. This table is gonna show us exactly what all the males do, all 800 males do under these conditions. Let's go to the first of the 256 entries. To the right of the colon, uh, it should actually be I think this is just a typo. There should be four zeros here. You'll notice there's always four digits to the right of the colon. The first digit after the colon represents uh, what, uh, what uh, males do when they hear zero, zero, which in this case, the first zero, which is not drawn here, is zero. The males stay still. If the, these males hear the second song, they still stay still. If they hear the third song, they stay still. If they hear the fourth song, they stay still. still. There are, at, at time equals zero, there were four males out of the 800 males that did that. So they would stay still regardless of which of the four songs 
they heard. Let's go to the final entry down here. Here, there were six males that would, three is turn right, they would turn right if they heard the first song, turn right if they heard the second song, turn right if they heard the third song, turn right if they heard the fourth song. There are six males that always turn right. Let's pick another random cell in this matrix, this one here. This says there are six males that go forward for three of the songs, but for the song zero one, the second song, they will turn left. So each of these uh, elements in this table report a, a subset of males out of the 800 and what those males do under all four, when they hear any of the four songs. So far so good? Okay, not surprisingly, if you look at all the numbers to the left of the colons in this table, it's more or less uniform, right? We've got uh, males that do all sorts of things. After 8,000 updates, you'll notice that most groups of males have gone extinct and there are certain species of males emerging. The biggest one is this group of 547 males here. Uh, uh, almost three quarters of all the males, that three quarters of the time they go forward. But when they hear the song zero one, the second song, they turn to the right. Yeah. It turns out that these 547 males who have this response, they're responding to females that actually only emit the first two songs. These males were observed to mate with females that only emit the first two songs, which correspond to the first two digits here. As this experiment continued, after 10,000 time steps, this species was still pretty numerous, but there was a growing species over here of males, a different set of males, that again would go forward most of the time, but these males would turn right when they heard the fourth song. These males tended to mate with a separate set of females from this group, and the females that these males mated with only emitted songs three and four. So there's two separate groups of females and two set, sets of males that respond appropriately to either of these groups. Obviously, males from this group can come into uh, the can come into hearing range of males, females from this group, but these males don't understand these female songs and don't respond appropriately and pass by these females and do not mate with them. If you are a male living in this uh, universe at this point in evolutionary time, what is the best possible thing you can do? Remember that a description of what a male does is a, a set of four digits. So for example, uh, if I say 1011, uh, one, this is me saying, I think these males are doing the right thing. They uh, go forward most of the time, but they stay still when they hear the second song. Which group of males are most, uh, which group of males are most likely to succeed in this world at this time? Any ideas? This group of males, 0000, zero, zero, zero as always in any universe, they're probably going to die out pretty quickly. They never move and by definition they are never going to find a female. This group of males down here, 3333, three, 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 these have all gone extinct because again they don't do the right thing. They always turn to the right. This group of males is doing pretty well. This group of males is doing pretty well. If you were an enterprising male agent in this environment, what is the best thing that you can do? No ideas? Shall we see what happens? You'll notice at 12,000 time steps, this group down here has started to grow in numbers. These males, 1313, one, three, are bilingual. 
They go, uh, they go forward and turn right when they hear song one and two. That means they're able to find and mate with the, this group of females. But they also go forward and turn right uh, when they hear the third and fourth song, meaning that they do the right thing when they come into uh, hearing range of these females. So by definition, these males are bilingual. They can understand to the two separate female languages that have evolved under this condition. And if we continue running this simulation forward, 14,000 time steps, 16,000 time steps, 20,000, 30,000, by 40,000 time steps, the bilingual males have driven the monolingual males and the males that don't understand any language to extinction. I'll leave that here as food for thought. Um, you have a quiz due tonight. I'll see you back here Thursday morning. Please read through all the final project materials. If you have any questions, please bring them to lecture on Thursday morning. Have a good rest of your day, everyone. Bye-bye.